not an issue. Triggers don't do that. And of course, I was wrong. This one's a cool one, triggers and locking. This was brought to our attention by a Ask Tom reader. Thank you to Jürgen. And it's something that I think you'll find very interesting. Can the triggers on a table impact the locks on that table? And this isn't some stealth locking in terms of if I put in a trigger, a select for update or a delete from some other table, obviously that would have locks on other objects. We're just talking about very simple triggers that do no other operations besides touching the, app, the values of the table concerned, can it impact the locking? And of course I replied and asked, I'm saying, no, of course not, that's not true. That's not an issue, triggers don't do that. And of course I was wrong. Let's have a look at some examples as to where this gets quite interesting. I have a parent table and I have a child table and we can see on line three that we are referencing the child back to the parent with a standard foreign key. Put an index to avoid the foreign key locking because I don't want that to disturb our uh, results here. Put a sequence on so we can put primary keys into each one. And just to prove that it all works, we have a parent table, parent row, put a child row in, it refers back to the parent, commit them all. That's just stock standard referential integrity. All works fine. Let's see what happens when we do an uncommitted transaction. I update the parent table, set a row. There's no triggers or anything involved yet. I go look at the video locked object, join it back to all objects based on the object ID. And as you'd expect, the parent table has a share level lock. Simply saying, I can't go mess with this table structure while I have an uncommitted transaction on it. That's all fine. Let's now do your classic triggers for these kind of tables. I wanna make sure that if someone doesn't provide the primary key, I'll go get one. You can see there on line eight, new primary key equals parent seek dot next file. And as so many of our tables have, we have a created column and an updated column. And so you can see the trigger is before insert or update. Let me highlight that before insert or update. If we're inserting, assign a primary key. If we're updating, log the fact that we've changed the row. These are very common triggers. You see them everywhere. If you ever built something with the, our cool quick SQL product, you'll see that they, these are the kind of triggers that we build. And I do the we have a standard trigger on the child table, same thing, populate a primary key, populate an updated column if someone doesn't update. Let's now do an insert into parent, insert into child, and the commit. This isn't testing locking, we're just making sure our triggers both work. And now we go into our uncommitted transaction. This is identical as it was before, just updating the parent, firing the parent trigger, and look what changes. Now, just by having a trigger on the parent table, it has no reference to the child table, and we haven't done anything to the child table in terms of DML, we actually have locked both the parent and the child. That's interesting. Now the question is why? Let's roll that back and explore. Here's the why. This isn't SQL. You can see I've just put some vertical bars here at the start here. This is just showing the actual trigger code itself. It's this line here. Most of us know that if you manipulate the primary key of a parent table in a foreign key relationship, we have to do some level of locking on the child table. If you haven't got a foreign key index, it's the entire table. If you have, it's still effectively a lock on the child just at share mode. Now you might be thinking, well, hold on a second. I didn't do an insert on the parent table. I only did an update. How come this, which only fires on insert, created this problem? It's because a trigger is code. What if the trigger was something like this? If inserting and two char state equals 12 and my function equals 10 and blah, blah, blah. The level of complexity in a trigger is obviously bound only to the complexity that you could have in PL SQL code. It could be incredibly complex. Yet before the trigger fires, we need to decide on whether you're going to be manipulating the primary key because we need to be able to lock the child before this operation commences. I don't know this for sure, but my hypothesis is, is all we do is we scan the trigger code and say, is there an assignment to the primary key? Effectively, is there a reference to the primary key on the left-hand side of an assignment statement. If there is, 
we're going to assume it could happen during the trigger fire, and therefore we're going to take these extra locks. And we can actually prove this. Even if I do something like if inserting and if the primary cue is null, which is never going to be true, we do it, we have the same locking problem. Do the update, no, no mention of insert, and yet we still have the lock on the child. Even if the trigger is tr so trivial like this, if it's false, it will never ever be true. And the only thing this trigger would ever do is that, but it'll never ever fire that code, run my update, I still have the lock on both the parent and the child. We simply are looking at, is there a primary key reference on the parent on the left-hand side of an assignment statement? So how do we solve it? We actually solve it very, very easily. All we have to do is only make sure we reference that insert code for an insert trigger. We just have to split our trigger up into two parts. Our first trigger is only on before insert, then we do this. Now, we will lock the child as part of that, but that is a valid case because we are genuinely going to be manipulating the primary key here because we're only worried about inserts. And then we have a separate trigger for our updates. And then we have just the update part of the code, just reflecting this. Notice there's no mention anymore of the primary key in this update trigger. So now when I go update the parent, it does fire the update trigger, but we only lock the parent table because there was no reference in the trigger code to the primary key of the parent table. Let's drop that trigger and let's move on a little bit more. This is ideally what we should be doing. Now that we've broken the trigger up into insert and update, well, ideally, ditch the insert trigger because more often than not, all it's really doing is populating default columns. And with 12.2 and above, you can do default on null, which means even if someone tries to force a null in, we will overwrite them. So in this case, I've simply said, when P, the primary key is null, we're going to use seek val as part of the declarative definition of the table. Same thing with the created column as well. And now inserts don't fire any triggers, which is great because that makes inserts rapidly fast. And as you can see, it all works as expected. That was the last row, the row number three. I still got a sequence value. I still got a created value. It all works. The only trigger now I have is an update trigger. And because the update trigger doesn't refer to the primary key, I'm not going to have those additional locks. So my overarching model is always this. Less triggers is good because less code, less complexity, less risk of these things happening. Ideally, you should almost never ever need an insert trigger just to populate the defaults. Because less locks are good. Don't get me wrong, these aren't sort of absolutely massive blocking locks. They're lock mode three, which are share level locks, but there are certain things you can still actually get into some interesting deadlock situations with these locks. That's how we discovered this. Uh, we found some interesting locking issues on some of our internal apps running in Apex that had been built with Quick SQL because by default Quick SQL builds one trigger with insert or update. Quick SQL fixes are coming. The team is working on the Quick SQL fix to actually carve that up into two separate triggers. And as I said, if you can do away with the insert trigger altogether, that's obviously your best option.